Welcome to the Beyond Boundaries program of Takshila Education Society, which aims at getting new voices and ideas to students, teachers, and parents of the Delhi Public Schools in Patna, Pune, Ludhiana, and Coimbatore. My name is Dr. Subodh Kerkar. I was a medical doctor running a hospital in Goa. But for the last 30 years, I am a full-time artist, and uh, I have started a museum in Goa, which is called Museum of Goa, MOG. I must tell you that I am a perfectly happy man because I have been doing what I love to do for the last 30 years. Not that I dislike medicine, I like medicine, nobody forced me to become a doctor. But then I realized that my real passion was in arts, so I gave up my medical practice and took to arts. And I believe that the only purpose of life is to be happy. And if you do something which you love to do, there is a possibility that you will be happy. But if you do something which you don't like to do, you will be definitely unhappy. So my advice to all of you is to please do what you love to do. That's very, very, very important. We are in the lockdown in Corona times. And you'll be wondering why in this Corona times I'm talking about art. Well, art is given very little importance in the education system today, but you are lucky that you have somebody like Sanju Kumar, who is the founder of your schools. And he has been exposed to art all around the world, and he understands the importance of art. And that's the reason why he requested me that I should speak to you. Well, usually people feel that art is an activity which you do in the time of leisure, to spend time of leisure. First, you study all the important things like uh, physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology. And then if you find time, do a little bit of art. I think this is a very wrong view because I believe that art is a very, very important aspect of human life. Actually, art is a foundation of human civilization. I would say that art is a womb in which human civilization is born. And I don't have to find distant examples to prove my point. For the last few weeks that everybody is locked in their homes, what kept them engaged? It was music. It was books, poetry, novels. It was cinema. It was uh, television. It was perhaps theater. So all arts actually sustained the whole of the world's humanity during this lockdown period and it continues to sustain it. I remember a very interesting statement by Winston Churchill, the then Prime Minister of England. When the World War II was happening, he was the Prime Minister, and somebody said that we should reduce the art budget in order to support the war efforts. So Winston Churchill said, what? cut down the art budget to support the war efforts, then why are we fighting for? What he meant was art, preservation of art, propagation of art is good enough reason to fight a war. So art is what makes us human. Animals do not create art. Human beings distinguish themselves from everybody else because they create art. And I'm talking about not just uh, painting and sculpture and installations, which I do. I am talking about all forms of art. I'm talking about cinema, I'm talking about music, theater, dance, uh, literature, because it is, it is this, these are the things which make our life enjoyable and what makes us human. Uh, there is a lot of confusion about what is art. Uh, there is not one definition about art, but I can tell you, if you want to find people who are closest to art, who actually live art, they are the tribal people. 
Because if you go to a tribal area, the way they dress is very artistic. Their homes are beautifully painted by themselves. They don't go and buy art from art galleries. They do it themselves. They create uh, 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 the beautiful dance forms, perhaps beautiful theater, jewelry. And their whole life is full of art. And that's, they are very close to nature. So I would put it in very simple words. Art is basically the ability to connect with the world to celebrate the world, to get fascinated with the world. Look at the sunset and say, wow, what a beautiful sunset. Look at the stars in the night and look and wonder about what they're doing. Wonder about the stars, look at the forest, the trees, the flowers, the butterflies, the birds, and get absolutely fascinated and basically uh, wonder about everything, love everything, what is the creation of God. And that uh, love, for all that which exists around us. That love for life and things which are around us is what is a function of art. Because art makes us closer to nature, closer to God. Art basically breaks the dualities. It's a little bit complex things for little children to understand, but art basically tells us that it is not enough to know the world. We also need to belong to it, become part of it and celebrate it. How do we celebrate it? Through art. You can draw a bird, you can uh, draw what you feel like. You can maybe write a poem. Like the tribals, when they dance, they imitate the animals, they imitate the birds. Uh, it's like a theater, it's like a performance. And so basically it is celebrating what they see around. So art is a celebration of life. Art is connecting with the world, owning it up, internalizing it. That's what is the purpose of art. Uh, well, I believe that all children are artists. What does a child do? A little baby finds a crayon or a pencil. All of you must have done it. Scribble on the wall. So this is a picture here, a scribble on the wall. Why does a child scribble on the wall? child scribbles on the wall because the child wants to say something, wants to express something. It's a way the child wants to express. And if there are people who specialize in studying the doodles and the scribbles of children and the drawings of children, and then they can do a psychoanalysis of the children. They can tell you what the child must be thinking. It's very, very important. Because, and it's very important to allow the child to continue to draw. What our society does is basically tells the child, don't draw, don't spoil the wall. But once, when my son was a little boy, and he used to go to the school, uh, one of the convent schools, the sister, the headmistress, called me once. And when I went to her office, she put forth a notebook of my son. On the front page of that notebook, he had scribbled with a ballpoint pen. Now, I looked at that and I was fascinated. I thought that is one of the wonderful works which he has created. The headmistress said, see what he's doing. But I said, uh, madam, uh, it's a very good drawing. So the point of the story is, it is very important to encourage our children to do what they want to do, what they want to draw. The idea of art education is not teaching you how to draw. Drawing how to draw, you very well know, and I'm going to prove that to you. The art education is basically to encourage you to respond to your lovely drawing, to understand what you want to express. That is what is art education. Picasso, a great artist, very famously said, every child is an artist, but it is very difficult to keep it up in adult life. Me, I'm 60 years old, and I can tell you, if I'm successful, if there is one reason why I am a little successful as an artist is because I have kept the child inside me alive. I am a 60 years old child. And that's very important for an artist to remain a child because there's nobody as creative as a child. So child's creativity needs to be encouraged, to be nurtured. A child should be encouraged to draw, to sing, to dance, whatever the child wants to do. And because the child wants to express something, and there should not be any hurdle in that flow of creativity. You know, there is a very, very nice saying in our society, hidden talent. Why is the word hidden talent used? I feel sometimes that the word hidden talent is used because a society has a knack of hiding talents of children. Hmm? And so we have to find that talent. 
One should never hide the talent. One should never suppress the talent of the children. Well, now, let us come to this. I said that I am a 60 years old child. Little babies make doodles on the walls. Do adults make doodles? Now, well, I'm going to show you a picture where adults also made doodles. But this was maybe 20,000 years ago. The cavemen drew on the walls of the caves. Of course, they drew on the walls of the caves because there was no paper available that time. But still, they had the feeling, the urge to express what they were feeling, what they were doing. So they did hunting uh, scenes on the walls of the grave. I must tell you a very, very nice story. One of the oldest caves in the world is about 18,000 years old. And that was discovered by a young boy whose name was uh, Marcel Ravidat and his dog, Robot. Now, Marcel Ravidat is a French boy. He was a teenager and he was very poor. And he had a dog called Robot. And he took the dog for a walk in the forest. He was working in a garage as an assistant, just helping the mechanic. And this poor boy went for a walk with his dog. And the dog fell into a hole. Robot, the dog, fell into the hole. So he climbed down into the hole. This was in 1940, on the 12th of September. He goes down into the hole and discovers the oldest drawing human beings have ever made, which is existing today. And this is a caves of a place called Lecoq's, Lecoq's Caves in, uh, in France. And these caves are 18,000 years old. There are almost about, uh, I think, uh, two, 3,000 drawings in these caves. And these drawings are of all kind of animals. A lot of them, there's a bull room. So the whole uh, cave is full of drawings of bulls, of deers, and horses. Look at these drawings. I find that these drawings are the most fascinating drawings. They are done with natural pigments and 18,000 years ago. And in this drawing, there's also one drawing, which I'm going to show you, which is the first depiction of a human body ever done by man, which is still uh, available. And this is a drawing in this cave where uh, you see there is, a, uh, there is a bull, and there's a little bird, and there's a man which is lying down. So this is the first human depiction. So these drawings which I'm showing you of the bulls and the deers are some of the first drawings ever done by uh, human beings, by the prehistoric man. We also have this kind of drawings in India. We have caves which are about, again, I think 10, 15,000 years old called Bhimbetka. Bhimbetka in Madhya Pradesh. And here we have wonderful drawings. And I think I have uh, included one of those drawings also in this presentation. Uh, there's another drawing in Spain, uh, which is uh, of a bull. And I must tell you the story of Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso goes to this cave, looks at this drawing, is so mesmerized by that drawing that he says, I don't think uh, anybody has done a better drawing than this uh, ever, even after this. So a drawing which was done some 15,000 years ago, according to Picasso, is one of the greatest works of art he has seen. And I completely agree with him, because these doodles, these drawings, are true expressions. You know, there is nothing in art which is uh, sort of, uh, is it, this is a right drawing or a wrong drawing. This is a drawing which is a true drawing, because the person who drew it felt like doing it, and so the expression was a sincere expression. And so Picasso felt that this is one of the greatest drawings, and I also agree with him. And I will now show you another bull. Look at this bull. Now, this bull is done by Pablo Picasso, one of the greatest artists. And see the similarity. This is also a very good drawing, of course, because he was a great artist. But this bull is as good as uh, uh, the cave drawings. So the cave drawings are as good as Picasso's drawings. Um, Picasso was a, a sort of a very, very special artist. And uh, he did a lot of drawings of bull. Now, why I'm uh, telling you about um, uh, Picasso's bulls is because many a times uh, people tell you, you have drawn a bull, oh, either mistake kia, a mistake ho gaya. This is not correct. As I, again, I can tell you that there is no one way of drawing a bull. Bull can be drawn in different ways. If you take a photograph of a bull, the bull will look in a certain way, a very realistic bull. But then one child will draw it in one way, another child will draw it in another way third child will draw it in third way, and all these 
drawings of bull are valid. So to prove this point, I'm going to show you how bulls have been drawn since uh, times immemorial. I already showed you the bulls which were drawn in the prehistoric time in the caves, and those are the cave bulls, and I showed you Picasso's bulls. I will show you a few more drawings of Picasso. Look at this bull. Uh, this is a bull uh, by Picasso. This is another bull, which is a very powerful line drawing of Picasso. Watch them, watch them very carefully, because there is a poetry in the line. There is a strength in the line, and you should notice that. Then there is a little sculpture Picasso did of bulls, just using plywood, and it is so beautiful. That is another depiction of a bull Picasso has made. Then Picasso started drawing bulls' heads, sometimes even bulls' skulls. So here is a, a kind of bull's head work, which is also a very famous work by Picasso. This is another simple line drawing of a bull. And here, he must not have even lifted the pen when he drew this bull. Uh, there is another bull head here, uh, which is on the wall. And look at the lovely colors he has used around it. And then he just uses a sit of a cycle, of a bicycle, the handle of the bicycle, and creates another form of bull. So see, Picasso himself has created so many different types of bulls. And then he made a bull mask, and he's wearing the bull mask. You can see the bull mask of Picasso. There are other very beautiful depictions of bulls, which are actually from India, and they belong to the Indus Valley civilization, which uh, was uh, there from about 2000 BC, uh, so almost about 3,000, 4,000 years ago. And uh, here, they had a lot of stamps, which we have discovered in Harappa, Mohenjo-Doro, and also uh, now many other sites which are in India. Harappa and Mohenjo-Doro are the pre in present-day Pakistan. They are one of the oldest civilizations of the world. The other oldest civilizations are Mesopotamian civilization, the Egyptian civilization, and the Inca civilization in South America. So this civilization is uh, 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 urban civilization and is supposed to be a very, very important civilization in the world and they have discovered thousands of stamps and these stamps have bulls on it and many other animals. Look at this bull from the Harappan civilization. Uh, it is a very strong, powerful bull and if you see on the top, we see some kind of a script. There's a lot of research going on to decipher, to understand what this script was, what it meant, but nobody has succeeded yet in finding out what that script meant because they feel that it may not be a script. It could be just a pictorial depiction of something or it could be just a name of somebody who actually uh, coined, uh, cast this coin. Uh, then we have lovely toys which we have found. I mean, the Harappan children uh, were playing with uh, terracotta toys. And look at this uh, uh, bu uh, bullock cart. And I must tell you a very interesting thing about bullock carts from uh, Harappan civilization. You know, uh, when you have a bullock cart, there's a certain distance between the two wheels. And uh, this distance between two wheels is more or less the distance between the backside of the two bulls after they're tied to the cart. And then the same distance is maintained over centuries and has permeated into even the present day carts and then even the early trains. They had the same distance. That's because the Harappan, car, uh, the, the bullock carts had that distance between the two, two, two wheels. Uh, here is uh, another toy with bulls with big horns. And you realize one thing. All these depictions of bulls are not realistic, not exactly the way the bull looks, but it's the artist uh, impression of that bull, how the artist looks at that bull. That is what is art about, not to exactly copy from nature, copy from the bull, exactly the, exactly the same bull, but to basically uh, depict the bull in your mind in the artist mind. That's what is art about. Otherwise, you can just take a photograph. And here, I have shown you so many different ways of depiction of bulls. Now, if you go to a uh, lot of tribal artists of India, they have also depicted bulls very beautifully. Look at this. This is uh, uh, Madhubani and uh, Madhubani depiction of bulls. So I'm going to show you a few of these uh, depictions. Uh, there are also gown depictions of bull. And they're so very different. Then I have uh, some of these bronze cast sculptures, 
uh, which are the bull sculptures. Here there is a bull which is actually hollow. So, so many different ways. And then you see another bull here where the head is a human head. So, I have shown you different ways the bulls are uh, shown. Now, let's go to a cat, for example. Now, how is a cat depicted by artists for centuries? Now, I'm showing you first a cat which is painted exactly the way the cat looks, a realistic uh, picture of a cat. Then I go to this other one, look at this blue cat. Uh, this blue cat is actually from South America, from Mexico, and I love it very much. And it has so much of decoration and there's a bird sitting on the tail of the cat. So this is a Mexican tribal artist uh, depicting the cat. There's another Mexican cat here, which is with big eyes and so beautiful. It is orange and blue. So artists have absolutely uh, no inhibitions. I mean, artists have the license to use whatever colors they want when they do a cat or they do anything else. Uh, here, look at the other work, which is from uh, Indian uh, miniature artist. Now here, you see a cat which is huge and a man is sitting on the top of the cat. The cat seems to be the vehicle of that man. The next work which I'm showing you is by a very important Indian artist called uh, Gemini Roy. Now he was from the Bengal school and uh, he uh, had a very special style of depicting uh, uh, people and animals. And here is his cat carrying a little kitten. Then in Bengal, there are uh, artists uh, who belong to a style of art which is called Kaligat, Kaligat painters. Uh, there's a temple of Kali and there's a ghat there. And the, this painters is to stay near this ghat and make drawings and sell them to the devotees who came. And this is, they are very, very beautiful works of art done by a new way of uh, kind of painting. And they did a lot of very interesting drawings of cats and tigers and uh, the men and women. And here is a cat looking at the birds from Kaligat style. And there is another one, two drawings of cats eating a lobster. I don't know why they used to do lobster, but there are two drawings of a cat with lobster. Uh, they belong to the Kaligat style of painting. Then we come to the next work, which is actually done by Pablo Picasso. Pablo Picasso uh, has a cat uh, with a dead rooster. And there are two uh, paintings of Pablo Picasso I'm showing you, both of them, cat and rooster. And then I come to the last drawing of the cat, which is also Picasso's, but if you just really observe it, you feel that it could be, it's like a drawing of a child. And Picasso himself said that when he was young, he used to paint like adults, and when he became old, he started painting like children. Hmm. Now, uh, let's go to the tiger, how tiger depicted in different styles by artists from different centuries and also the present day artist. Now here, first I'm showing you a tiger which is painted in an absolutely realistic style, uh, sitting very majestically on a, a wooden uh, log which has fallen. These are gowned uh, uh, paintings of tiger. Look at these two tigers, ferocious, looking at you. And then I saw one lovely sculpture by a gowned artist in uh, Bharat Bhavan, and I was really fascinated by this. This tiger, uh, the sculpture of the tiger, is made with wooden blocks painted in white, black, and ochre, uh, red oxide, red oxide, white, and black. And this is so beautiful, I feel that this is one of the, one of the, one of the very, very good works of art I've ever seen. It's that good. And then the authorities in Bharat Bhavan in Bhopal told me that this sculpture has traveled around the world in many exhibitions. So it is always invited, the sculpture is invited to be shown in major exhibitions worldwide. And then we have another uh, gown tiger. Then we have a sculpture of a tiger uh, done in traditional casting style. Uh, we have another tiger here. And look at this uh, uh, style of gowned uh, tigers. There's a tree which is almost emerging from the tiger. The red tiger is also done in a completely different style. And then here we have uh, two tigers uh, sort of uh, perhaps uh, talking to each other, cuddling each other. And these are also gowned tribal art. And then we have the Madhubani tiger with a big a red tongue projecting out. And then I'm showing you a picture of a little boy. His name was uh, 
Edmund Thomas Klimt. This little boy, which you see in the picture, he died, unfortunately, at the age of seven. He was from Kerala, and I had an opportunity to meet his parents. And they told me that he has, he had done more than 25,000 paintings. And when I looked at those paintings of this little boy, Edmund Klimt, uh, I was fascinated. Now, I'm going to show you two drawings of Edmund, of Tiger. And uh, I think these drawings of uh, Tiger, which Edmund did, are as good as Picasso. There, because he had such a lovely line, because he was encouraged by his parents, and he drew wonderful drawings. If you go to the internet, you can say Edmund Thomas Klimt, you can find a lot of work of Edmund uh, on the internet. Um, now, let's come to the goat. Now, how goats have been depicted? Of course, I can go on and on because there are so many different ways goats have been drawn, but I have just chosen a few drawings of goats which uh, I really like. The first one is a sculpture of goat by Picasso. Uh, Picasso did a lot of sculptures of goats. And then there is the next one, which is a lovely drawing, a line drawing of a goat. And then we come to a tribal head in, done in terracotta. Of, it's a goat head. And this large sculpture which you see, which is uh, in, uh, on a lawn, is uh, by a very famous sculptor called Henry Moore. Henry Moore is an English sculptor, and he did a lot of bronze sculptures. They are some of the most important sculptures uh, of the world. And these sculptures are inspired by ships, because in the area where Henry Moore lived, there was, uh, I mean, large, vast meadows, and they were full of ships. And the form of the ship, he got so fascinated with it, he started doing sculptures of the ships. Again, if you go to the internet and say Henry Moore ships, you will see a lot of sculpture. So these are ships created by Henry Moore. Uh, these are Indian tribal sculptures of goat. Uh, look at this goat. Um, these are, uh, in Bastar, they do this casting with uh, a very special technique. So this is the sculpture from Bastar. Uh, it's called Dokra casting. Uh, look at this fish now. I mean, if you see fish depicted worldwide by different artists, again, you find uh, very, very uh, interesting variations in different ways. So this is a uh, fish again by, I think, a Mexican artist, tribal artist. Then we have the wooden sculpture of the fish is uh, African tribal uh, sculpture. Then we have um, some child which has drawn this big whale with a uh, lot of things happening on the top. These are Madhubani depictions of fish. And then uh, the last one I'm showing you is in terracotta. And that was a sculpture of fish Picasso did. Now the next drawing I'm showing you, next painting I'm showing you is Picasso's horse. Now let's see how different artists have depicted horses. So Picasso, this is an early painting of Picasso, and the horse is almost realistic. Picasso did a lot of horses later, which were absolutely stunning, and they were sort of totally distorted, and they were very powerful. And we had our own uh, M.F. Hussein, who was an important Indian artist, who had also done very interesting horses. So now look at this horse, which is a uh, uh, work by, I think, uh, the Kaligat uh, artist. And then the next one, which is like a horse done with two triangles, is the Warli horse. Warlis are the tribals of Maharashtra, and they do very lovely drawings, very simplified drawings. And this is a Warli horse. This is a Dokra sculpture of a horse. The next one is again a Dokra sculpture. And then we come to a Picasso's drawing of a horse. This is a Picasso's drawing of a horse, where the horse is absolutely drawn completely in a very free way. Uh, let's come to some birds. Now, the first bird I'm showing you is a Warli bird. The Warli tribal artists have done the bird. The next one is by Pablo Picasso. I'm again and again showing you Picasso's works because he has done so many different varieties of work, and that's the reason he's considered one of the greatest artists of the world. And then you have uh, the works from Madhubani and Gound ways. And I have also shown you one work which is from the Indian uh, traditional painting, Indian miniature paintings, where it is a Jatayu. Jatayu and Ravana is taking Sita, and then the Jatayu is trying to stop him. So that is what is depicted in this bird drawing, a bird painting, which, is, uh, which belongs to the Indian miniature style. Now, if you see the next one, uh, it's a Dao. 
When you look at this, you will immediately say world peace. That's because uh, Picasso was asked to do a symbol of peace by the United Nations and he drew a Dao. Since then, Dao became a symbol of peace. You know, every year uh, there are some social clubs who invite me to be a chief guest in an annual drawing competition for children. And the theme every year is world peace. So I, have, I must have gone many, many times in the last 30 years. And every time I go there, I see the same paintings done by children. I see the Tao, because the teachers and the parents have told the children that Tao is a symbol of world peace, so please draw Tao. Then they draw a globe, the world globe. Then they have flags of different countries, uh, people holding hands. Then sometimes they draw a mosque and a church and a temple to show uh, sort of togetherness of all religions and world peace. So this is what is drawn by almost every child without exception. Now here there is something wrong. Uh, every child draws this globe, uh, flags and the Tao because they have been told by their teacher and by their parents that this is what is world peace, so draw this. Now, if a child is left to himself or herself and is asked to come on depict, do something about world peace, the child's ideas might be completely different. The Tao was Picasso's idea. The child might draw just, uh, uh, just sitting with the grandfather or the grandmother was playing with their parents as a symbol of world peace or just going into the forest and watching the birds and the butterflies. So every child will have uh, his or her own imagination about what the world peace is about and that child will depict it. Telling the child to do this is actually uh, the biggest mistake teachers and parents do because they completely kill the creativity. They squeeze out the creativity from the children like a dhobi squeezes out water from a towel. Um, so one should never tell the children what to draw. That is a big, big, big kind of a wall in their creativity. And one should give them all the freedom to do what they want. Uh, now I'm going to show you a very short film of Picasso drawing which might inspire you. You can later on go uh, on the Google and check out Pablo Picasso. There will be many videos and many paintings of Picasso available. But this is a very short film which tells you how Picasso drew, what kind of a freedom he had when he drew.
now I decided that uh, uh, the last part of my lecture would be showing you some of the works I did and my own development as an artist. Uh, my father was an artist and uh, he painted in very realistic style, wonderful landscapes and portraits he did. And uh, he did not do anything very modern, so-called modern art. He did something which was uh, traditional. And that's what we learned as children. And so I started painting watercolors first. So my father taught me how to paint a watercolor landscape. If you see this painting of a house, which I have done, one of my early paintings when I was still perhaps in school, uh, you can feel the sunlight. Now, this is a technique of uh, showing it. You know, it's, uh, if you look at this watercolor, you find that the brightest part here is the white of the wall. That is the brightest. And the darkest part here is inside the door, the entrance of the house or inside the window. And all the other colors are sort of in between in tones. So there is a way of depicting sunlight. Well, I could uh, give you a separate lecture about how to draw sunlight and how to show light and shade effect. But I will just show you to the time being a few of my watercolors and which I did sitting outside. Because when I gave up my medicine, after that I did a lot of watercolors and I used to sit outside on the roadside. And my patients used to wonder what has got wrong with this doctor. He had a very good practice and now he's it's on the roadside and draws watercolors. Many people ask me, normally people like to climb up the ladder of success as a person. Why did you come down? Let me tell you that doing what you love to do is what is success because that is what gives you happiness. I equate success with happiness. Happiness is success because the purpose of life, as I told you earlier, is to be happy. So anyway, so I'm going to show you a few of my early works. I showed you, this is the next work which I'm showing you, which is uh, painted in Portugal. This is, a, uh, this is a street in Lisbon I painted. This is the next one, next two works are also in Lisbon. I had an opportunity to travel and so wherever I used to go, I used to paint. Uh, these are some works, uh, uh, paintings of fishermen and the boats, which I'm going to show you now. So I used to paint very realistic works of the uh, fishermen and the boats. Uh, look at this yellow one, this uh, little black thing which you see there is a piece of wood all the fishermen use to pu push their boat into the water. Then I decided uh, why paint the boats. I started buying old boats because what had happened was all the fishermen who used to use wooden boats had, were slowly shifting to fiberglass boats because fiberglass boats were lighter they did not require maintenance and they consumed less petrol for the engine. So they were going for fiberglass boats and they didn't know what to do with the old wooden boats. So I used to buy them and use this wood to create works of art. Now there is a very interesting thing happening here. When you use old wood from wooden boats, the wood has memory because the wood remembers uh, all the voyages which the boat has done. It remembers the nets full of fish. It remembers the songs of the fishermen. Actually, some fishermen told me when they're in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, after they cast their net, uh, I asked them, what do you do? They said, sometimes we do the rehearsal for the drama in which we are participating. In Goa, uh, uh, the local theater is very popular and they do the rehearsal there. So the pieces of the boat, the pieces of the wood from the boat remember those rehearsals. So when I use these pieces of wood for creating my work of art, what am I doing is I am using history, I am using memory as a medium, as a material for my sculpture. Look at some of these uh, sculptures created with old wooden uh, boats. And then I did this large work with the boats, uh, which I took all the way to Dubai for an art fair there. And it was uh, placed next to Burj Arab, which is uh, one of the most important buildings of Dubai. So I showed my work there. Um, next few works I'm going to show you are uh, with palm leaves. Uh, all the coast of India has a lot of uh, palm trees and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, different uses of the palm leaves. They are used for thatching the roofs. They are also knitted very beautifully. In Konkani, it is called mall. Mall is a knitted palm leaf and I really like it. So once I just uh, sprayed some gold color on this uh, leaf and created a wall with it. 
It looks very fascinating. It was a simple material, and I liked it so much, I converted it into a sculpture. So look at my sculptures of the palm leaves. These are done in fiberglass, and I placed them next to a pond which we have near my house. Then, you know, the, the stock of the palm leaf, the, 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 uh, the palm leaf has, is very long, and the stock is called pido. So I created this lovely circle with the, the stock of the palm leaves. I will show you a few lambs which I have created. I did a lot of lambs because I used to love to do lambs with terracotta. So these are some of my terracotta lambs. Then I did some metal lambs. And the last thing I'm going to show you are the works I did with sand and light. One day, I had done a disc in copper, about uh, two meters in diameter. And I took this, uh, this disc was for a hotel lobby. It was a light. I didn't know what came over me. Those days I used to have an open jib. So I put my disc in my jib and went to the beach. We dug a crater in the sand uh, in the afternoon. It was a perfect crater. I took the help of a mason, a laborer, and he did a perfect crater. And I put a disc on the top of the crater. There were electrical bulbs fitted under the disc, and there was a rod which fixed it to the sand. I took the electrical connection from a beach shack in Goa, we have a lot of uh, small restaurants on the beach, which are called beach shacks. So I took the electrical connection from them. And at about 5.30, 6 o'clock, I put the lights on. And I can tell you, I couldn't believe my own eyes. This was not an intentional work of art. This just happened. Many a times, works of art happen to you. So this is, uh, I, I, it looked like a a planet, a new planet, and there were only that time nine planets, so I called it the tenth planet. So this is called the tenth planet, and it was a work which was my first installation on the beach using uh, light and sand. After that, I kept doing more and more works using the same medium. I started working with sand and light and shells, and uh, these are some of the works which I'm going to show you. Uh, the next one is called The Memory of Sunset on the Sand. Now, if any child is asked to draw a sunset, what will the child draw? The sun, and then three, four lines in a triangular fashion. That's what is the sunset for a child. So I started thinking that maybe the sand is remembering the sunset, like a child. And so I drew this triangle with just, uh, uh, I created some kind of sort of walls uh, with the sand and put the light behind it. And this is called the memory of the sunset on the sand. The next one is just a hole in the sand and light inside the hole and some shells which I placed at the border of the hole. So these are the works with uh, uh, just light and sand. Uh, then I, had, I made cones. Every child, uh, the first sculpture every person makes as a child is the cone. And I must have made a lot of cones. Those of us who live in Goa or in the coastal areas will go to the beach and make the cones. Others in the city will make in the sand pits, which are there in many parks. But cone is made by almost every child. So this is a memory of the cones which I made as a little boy. All that I have done is I have a little moat around it and I have put electrical lights in it. And then I have made many lamps with uh, uh, just bamboo. These are bamboo lamps which I have made. The whole purpose of today's lecture was to basically tell you how an artist works, to tell you that art is not just about doing uh, drawing or doing uh, painting, a uh, landscape or a portrait. You can work with sand, you can work with light, with shells, you can work with many different things. I think uh, in future we will have some more lectures for you where I will introduce you to the concept of uh, uh, conceptual art, how different artists work, how different artists, what they think and how they create art. But I think uh, uh, my uh, engagement with you would be, uh, would consider it successful if it sort of uh, sparks some kind of uh, interest in all of you that you should look at more and more art. Thank you very much for giving me a very patient hearing.